Hello everyone, we're here today to talk about uh, FIMS version 1.1. So we're going to cover uh, basically what FIMS 1.1 is, where we stand in terms of the, the project, uh, and uh, we'll show you a couple of uh, very cool things around, uh, around what's included in the box. Um, okay, so first of all, the scope of um, FIMS 1.1. So that includes a couple of things. Uh, number one, um, and that's that's really the uh, you know one of the very important component of uh, of uh, 1.1 is there's a repository uh, interface that have been modeled uh, as a new interface uh, to the existing uh, uh, interface that have been already provided as part of FIMS version 1.07 that were capture transfer and transform so that's uh, uh, that's a new one it's actually in terms of size it's quite large you're gonna see that. Uh, the second item that's included in FIMS 1.1 is uh, uh, we added a, a REST interface on top of the existing SOAP interface for the capture, transfer and transform services. And the last uh, set of items that have been included as part of FIMS 1.1 is a set of uh, small changes that we made uh, to uh, some of the object model uh, based on some feedback that you received from the uh, early implementer. Okay, so that's FIMS 1.1. Uh, the teams that were involved with uh, implementing FIMS 1.1 were at follow. Uh, the original um, interfaces were developed by the FIMS technical board as a group. Uh, we had decided to actually to define subgroup in order to uh, uh, provide a you know, parallel track in developing the FIMS repository interface and developing the FIMS REST interface. Uh, the FIMS repository interface is composed of you know, 47 members. Uh, I am chairing that, uh, that group. The FIMS REST interface uh, is composed of 25 members. Uh, and that, that uh, Richard Cordray from Quantel is actually the chairman of that, uh, of that project. Okay. Okay. So first, uh, we're going to focus on uh, the repository interface. Okay. I'm going to provide some details uh, about it. Um, let's start by um, going over uh, some history about the project. Uh, that project was initiated by the FIMS Business Board. They defined the repository interface as, at the time, the most important need for the media organizations and uh, uh, provided uh, a project charter to the FIMS Technical Board to uh, develop that, uh, that interface. Okay. So the FIMS uh, repository group uh, um, was actually uh, put together in uh, June 2012. Uh, from that group, as I mentioned earlier, is a subgroup of the FIMS uh, technical board. Uh, here is a list of contributors uh, that are members of that group since its initial uh, form, uh, creation. That group has not, has not stopped growing. Uh, I can say that uh, uh, we have some very active members uh, that are coming from you know, different um, type of vendor organizations, going from storage to MAM to post-production um, to also uh, uh, some media organizations uh, that have been really contributing in um, Provide in, in, in describing uh, some very basic information about the, the needs of the repository interface, and that has been extremely important uh, in terms of the creation and what in terms of the creation and the designs of the of the, the interface itself. Okay. okay. In terms of uh, what we have accomplished since the beginning, uh, it's actually you know, quite a lot. Uh, and I will have some numbers later on to, um, to show you about that. Uh, the first phase of the project was to truly really understand the requirements and define some high-level requirements. We then, needed, we then did a technical analysis uh, of those requirements uh, and in basically converting them into you know, um, use cases that were in some ways technical but also aligned with uh, the work that had to be done within FIMS itself. Uh, and that led us to the next step of the project, that was the designs and the implementations of the interface itself. So 
We weren't done at that time because we actually used that information and we did some true validations on the repository interface by having vendors taking that interface and trying to marry that interface with their existing internal API and the product capabilities. Uh, and we've also um, taken those operations and apply you know, uh, the REST layer on top of the SOAP interface that we had created. At that time, the REST project has uh, had gotten off the ground and there was there had some very good traction. So this is basically where we align the two projects together. Um, then we got into uh, uh, into a step of you know, documentation. Uh, one very important aspect of it was the uh, the technical specifications that we have uh, that we have completed. Okay. We are now um, in uh, the the stage of doing two things. Uh, number one. There's a, there's a type of documentation that is still ongoing, that is the implementation guidelines. And we have plan of creating uh, implementation guidelines that will really help uh, uh, implementers on the vendor side and on the, um, uh, on the media, organization, media organization side of it to really uh, learn the best practice about how to do those things. Uh, there's actually a session um, that We'll probably, there's probably a link somewhere that we're going to put uh, as, part of a, as part of this presentation or at the end of it. Um, and that link would be to uh, the presentation that describes a sample implementation that is part of the Things 1.1 package. And there's some uh, use cases uh, that, would, that are presented within that session. So there's, um, uh, I was referring to, a, to another presentation where this, that will be linked to this one that represents the sample repository implementations. I encourage you to actually to take a look at that session if you want to learn more about how to implement uh, the repository interface. Uh, there will also be the implementation guidelines that will be available soon after uh, NAB. Uh, another thing that needs to happen before we fully release the FIMS repository inter interface as part of the FIMS 1.1 package is the EBU slash AMOA review. Uh, it is ongoing. So far, we have received very good feedback from, uh, from uh, uh, we have received some very uh, good feedback about what they've able to, uh, um, to review. Um, so the expectation is soon after NAB, we will release the final versions of the FIMS 1.1 package. Okay. Some numbers about the repository interface. Um, uh, one of the things that, that you know, has been very important for me to also to communicate to the to the rest of the uh, the films community and the outside world is the fact that you know this is not something that was just slapped together. We have spent a tremendous amount of time and brain powers in creating uh, that interface. Uh, in terms of the uh, the number of meetings and hours and the complexity of what has been put in place, uh, there's a serious amount of. Uh, uh, many hours that have been put together to uh, uh, combine uh, 2,400 uh, of combined many hours of designs and implementations. And now, if there's anything to learn from that is by looking at the film repository interface, even if you don't implement it, there's probably a lot of things you can learn from it. Okay. So, the, the repository interface uh, definitions, you know, what it is and what it is not. As the, uh, the, ver the first version, the initial version of the repository interface, there's a couple of uh, must-have that we had to do. And those are basically what's listed in the, what it does. Um, obviously, a repository is more than just a set of folders where you copy files to. Okay? Uh, repository means really object storage. So we're providing CRUD capabilities uh, for the content itself and for the essences uh, as well. Uh, we also uh, expose a way to um, create a data and manage metadata around the assets. Uh, um, by having that metadata in place around, around those media assets, we also uh, created a query mechanism in order for uh, consumer system to retrieve that information and to search for information. So, um, the, the, the repository interface you know, fits uh, uh, within a, a, an organization ecosystem as a service. It's, it is direct, it's not aimed at being directly used by a user interface, but it is a position to be leveraged from a workflow orchestration engine. Okay. So what we have not implemented, 
as part of the initial version is uh, to handle complex operation baked in within the repository operation themselves. Okay? So when you actually do an ingest of a piece of content, um, you know, we're not tying that operations to a transcoding or to a transfer uh, themes operations. You can implement it internally, no, no, nothing stops you from doing that, but we haven't baked that within the, the, the interface design itself. Um, and that's something that you know, we may extend later on, but this is not part of the original uh, of this version. Um, in terms of providing some capabilities that are really at the, the MAM level of linking assets together, defined parent-child relationship, it is, it is also not something that is um, that has been designed as part of the repository operations. But the BM content type itself, that is the object that represents media set, you know, can be used and some of these properties can be leveraged in order to achieve uh, that requirement. So uh, the operations are not there to be able to you know, create the relationship, but the object model supports it. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, the interface is not really aimed as being leveraged directly from a, from a user application um, due, to the, to, due to the nature of the atomicity of those, uh, of those operations. Okay. The architecture of the interface itself uh, uh, has been defined by uh, following some design considerations. Um, number one, it had to be it had to support the SOAP protocol and now the REST protocol as well. Okay? Um, some of those operations uh, have basically that, that interact with uh, the content itself that are um, in a way uh, very simple when it, when it comes to uh, processing times where you're actually not dealing with, uh, with touching the physical bytes of an essence. Uh, those are synchronous operations. We also had to create an asynchronous patterns in order to act upon the essences themselves. Okay. Uh, we also baked in within the operations the ability to, uh, uh, to support uh, uh, credentials and or session information. It's not something that, 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 you know, that we enforce uh, an implementer to use a, a specific authentication method, but the model actually supports it. So if you have specific requirements in how you handle operation, either at, uh, how you handle uh, 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 authentication and security, and if it's at the operation level, at the service level, all of that can be added to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, to the uh, repository interface. Okay. Uh, one of the, uh, the things that is a really a first for a film service is uh, the eventing model that we had designed. Uh, that is based on the ability for the service to send events depending on some internal actions that are happening within the, service, within the service itself. That can be tied to an operation that was on the service or that can be tied to something else happening within the, the service itself. Okay? We also uh, have created another you know, component called um, uh, uh, RCR and I'm going, to, I'm going to go into more details in some of the later slides here. And it's really a component that uh, um, also is the first for a film service that represents uh, a service that is uh, uh, that, that exposes all of the properties and capabilities and configuration uh, uh, fields of the, of the service itself. Uh, not all implementations um, are created equally. So we wanted to provide some flexibility for the implementers uh, as well as a mechanism for them to expose the capabilities and the behavior of the implementation. And that's what that service will do. Okay. Um, segue into uh, what I was describing. So the repository capability registry that I've listed there, that is a service that uh, um, has a separate endpoint that you can use to retrieve all of the properties uh, uh, and the configuration uh, uh, fields of the service itself. Okay. That also gives a lot of power to the implementer to also beg any type of customization that they may make to the service itself. There's actually sections where they can actually uh, represent that information within the, the RCR. Uh, obviously, uh, the bread and butter of that service is uh, the film repository interface service that contains all the CRUD operations where you basically act on the content and the essences. 
And the last uh, uh, service that we have created is a service that now do not receive information, but that send information to an external, let's say, message broker. Uh, that information about uh, you know, callback for uh, services, for the asynchronous operations. Also send back some information regarding uh, events that may, that may be generated within the service itself. As an example, uh, let's say that if one of the storage volume runs out of capacity, you know, this is an event that will be sent to that for someone to actually to receive information and to act upon that. Okay. So the FIMS asset concept. So this is something that was not introduced within the FIMS repository interface because it's already available as part of the capture, transfer and transform. Uh, but it is being leveraged to its full potential within the repository interface. And let me describe that in a bit more details because it is very important for the um, uh, for the, 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 the rest of the presentation here. The repos uh, a media asset is different than a file. We all know that. Okay. Uh, but having the ability to properly represent an essence that is a file and an, uh, that an object that is really um, uh, an asset is crucial to, um, uh, to how information will be um, uh, will be stored and also will be structured within the repository itself. Uh, so the object that we that we are dealing with here is the BM content type. The BM content type is the object that contains all of the information that there is to know about the asset itself. It contains editorial information. It contains all the information about the identifications of the asset itself, and there's um, uh, the ability for that identification to be extended to support multiple IDs. Uh, the, that object that also contains descriptive metadata um, can contain what, what is listed here as many BM content type formats. So what it means, it means that an asset can, uh, a media asset that represents a piece of content, and a piece of content can be know, presentation that NAB of the FIMS 1.1 uh, package. That's the content itself. The format is, okay, we're going to have an HD file coming out of uh, the camera that is recording right now. We may have a proxy, a low, low bitrate uh, uh, version of that content that will be published to, let's say, YouTube. Those are two different formats. Same, same media asset per se, two different formats for that asset. That will be represented by two BM content format type. Okay? So that, that, um, that object uh, also uh, contains a lot of properties that describe the format itself in terms of the bitrate, in terms of the resolutions, in terms of uh, um, uh, maybe the codec that was used to, uh, uh, to, repress, to, uh, to encrypt that, uh, to encode that, uh, that video. That format may, or may have one or many BM essence locators. The BM essence locators represent the locations where that physical essence is being stored. Uh, and so that means that you know, that physical file now may live uh, into one storage, may live into an archive storage as well. It's the same format, but there's two locations for, that, uh, for, for, the set, for the set of files representing that asset. That's what the BM essence locator really represents here. Yeah. Um, same thing. There's metadata at that level as well that describes the storage type, that describes how to retrieve that information from that storage. Um, in this, there's the information in here that has been modeled based on some of the work done at EBU within EBU core. So some of that information is available at the top level within a beam content type level, within a beam content type layer to represent editorial metadata. We also have some part of EBU core that is uh, available at the BM content format to, dis to describe descriptive, to describe um, technical metadata uh, around, the, uh, around the format itself. Okay. A little bit about uh, the BM essence locator. So this is something that is uh, actually um, quite flexible within FIMS. Uh, you know, what, is a, what is a media essence? Okay. In its most simplistic way, it's a file. It's one file. But the media set can be a collection of files. The media can be a collection of files where uh, you may have the audio that is separated the video and you actually have, may have many of those files. If you deal with uh, streaming, now you may have many fragments. Okay? So we, uh, within FIMS, uh, you know, one of the requirements is to be you know, format agnostic when it comes to media files. So one, uh, uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was not to create a, 
um, a specific way of representing each format that exists in, in today's market, uh, because that keeps changing. And you know, to maintain that is something that, that uh, will have been quite difficult. So instead, we created a pattern and we created a set of objects that allows for different type of uh, format to be supported in terms of the simple, simple file, in terms of a, a, a format that supports a list of files. Uh, an example that would be uh, the, 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 the streaming format with uh, fragmentations of, with a bunch of fragments. Uh, or it can be that uh, a specific uh, uh, object is created to describe uh, a pre, um, to describe them a well-defined format. In this scenario, it's a XDCAM there. Within the themes object, let's say that you have your own format um, as a vendor, or as a media organization, you have created a structure that represents your, uh, your, your file format. You have the ability to create an object within themes that you plug as a BMSS locator type. So it is totally extendable. Uh, so let's say that your, stora your storage uh, basically represent an asset by leveraging a collection of folders and files, you have the ability to, uh, uh, to model that, uh, to register that, that, uh, that asset, uh, um, to register that, that schema within the OCR itself, and then to leverage it from there. And now that becomes something that is available when you uh, load a BM content type and that your consumer of that service can actually understand. Okay? So as an example, you know, I wanted to uh, uh, to describe a simple theme asset here. So, you know, what does that mean to basically put data within uh, uh, the BM content type itself? Well, you know, there's some identifiers. Those belong to the BM content type level right in here, okay? Uh, I mentioned earlier that you can support multiple IDs to represent the same content. That is extendable. Let's say that uh, you have your own, each system has a, have a way of generating their own IDs but you may have within organizations uh, the ability to generate unique IDs across many repositories. You have the ability to plug that in directly within the BM content type itself. Okay? Uh, some metadata okay, uh, about the asset, okay? editorial metadata, uh, we all have that. The fact that you've got that, that asset and you have a pre, well, uh, predefined structure to, uh, to basically uh, specify that metadata, that gives you a model um, in order to map maybe your, your, the metadata that exists with some of your system today to something that is well structured within themes that represent uh, the best practice in terms of metadata, editorial metadata management. Yeah. Um, then you've got your BM content format type. So there's some properties, as I mentioned, about the, code, the video codec, the audio codecs, and uh, those are some of the properties that you have there. And then you have your BM essence locator type where now you have, property, you have uh, properties that describe the type of storage as well as um, the location of that storage. And the uh, item that you see here that is, you know, file uh, storage slash my file.mpeg4, that represents the path of that file. In that scenario, I'm using a simple locator type, one file. Okay. Now, I expect that a lot of you will have some issues with this, if, that, if the only thing we can do is that. Well, we can do a lot more because in every single scenario um, and every single instance, you probably need to extend the schema to support some of your you know, business needs. Well, at every single one of those levels, you have the ability to extend it. Okay? And that's baked in within the, the designs of the, of the, the BM content type and the other themes objects themselves. You know, extension has been, uh, has been a very important requirement from day one. Okay? And we provide the ability for whoever is doing these implementations to extend it based on their need. By doing that, as a vendor, you can create those extensions, you can register them within the RCR itself, and now they become part of that implementation. As a customer, you can also create your extension here okay, for your specific implementations. So it really provides you the ability to be very flexible in terms of how you use that asset representation within themes. Well, um, I wanted to describe in here, uh, now that we have the repository service in place, uh, uh, a simple use case of where the different theme services and the repository interface you know, really fit together. Um, one of the things that is now important is you can actually, from 
you, if you can start a workflow and fully implement that workflow using themes. You know, up to now, the only thing that was available was transfer, transform, and transfer. Now we've added the repository. That means that you can get the content from one place, you can move it, you can transform it, you can move it back somewhere else, and you can store it somewhere, you can store it into a different storage. Well, that's basically all of our workflows. You know, we produce something and we put it somewhere for distribution. Or we put it something, we produce something and we put it somewhere for, you know, archiving. Well, you can go from A to Z now using themes. Okay? And if we look at the BM content type that we had before, well, the information that is flowing from one of the services to the other service is that same object. Okay? One good thing about this is the fact that those services have the ability to understand the BM content type and also understand what, I call, what we call dark metadata, that is really the, uh, the, uh, the ability to, use some, to take some information. If they don't really need it, they don't destroy it. But when they have to give it some, to, some, to another service, they provide it because they may actually need that data. So that's available here. So that same asset that is coming out of that repository that is going to your transfer service here, that is going to your transcode service, that is coming out of your transfer service, it is going to that repository over there, will contain that entire BM content type here. Okay? So now we really start seeing the, really the power of themes and the powers of the object model that is behind themes. Okay. <coughs> The, uh, uh, the, the FIMS repo repository operations. We can talk, I can talk for hours about this, and I'm not gonna do that today, but uh, the documentation that comes within the FIMS 1.1 package goes into um, a lot of details about each of those operations. There's a few things that I want to, to, uh, uh, to describe about those operations. Uh, that is the fact that you know, there's a, there's a substantial amount of operation that we have defined. Uh, each of those operations have been carefully designed to provide um, or to meet the needs of the project charter that was defined for the project itself. Uh, each operation also has been designed in such a way that it meets the goal of the media organizations and meets the goal of the vendor. You know, we haven't designed something that cannot be implemented. So the operations are actually divided into different buckets. There's operations that act on the content itself, so that's creating the objects within the repositories. There are the operations that act on the essences, that touch the physical bytes of the, of the, the media itself. Okay. So a lot of those operations are represented in a blue category there. Some of them are synchronous, some of them are asynchronous. The rule of thumb is, if it's something that is acting on the object itself, it's probably synchronous. If it's something that is acting on the, on the essences, then it's probably an asynchronous operation due to the fact that it takes time for that operation to take place. Okay. So the one other um, um, type of operation that we had defined that is content query is uh, based on an open model um, that allows consumer to build queries on the content itself, based on the capability of the service. You know, if the service only exposes simple operators between uh, uh, query parameters, then this is the only thing you can do. If uh, a more complex operation that allows, then you can actually build more complex primitive in terms of querying the content. Okay. The next item is the generic unit ID. This is not something that you have to implement within the repository interface. If you already have a way of generating and you're already generating unique identifiers for your content, then you can use what you have. If not, you can use that operation that comes with the service here. Yeah. Okay. Then we have some operations that are a bit more on the advanced side that has to do with locking and unlocking the content itself. Um, we're not dealing with files here, we're dealing with objects. Okay. So the ability to uh, uh, to a workflow to state that the content is being used by a given task and I don't want anyone else to touch it, you know, is implemented with the lock mechanism here. Okay. Um, as I said, not all repository implementations are created equal and some implementation will not support locking. And that's also a feature that you can enable or disable within the repository capability registry, RCR, during, your, during the, uh, uh, the, 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 the implementations of, uh, of the service. 
good segue to the RCR. Those are some of the op those are the op operations of the repository capability re repository capability registry itself. So as you can see, <coughs> there are several operations. Okay, each of those operations retrieve a set of properties about how some of the features were implemented on that. So. Um, it is something that uh, is really represented by a set of you know, objects that come back to those operations when you actually call them. But typically, this is something that is implemented by vendor as a set of XML document that are stored within the service itself. Okay. Uh, and it is up to the vendor to come up with that configuration. And they can do it based on their product. They can also do it based on the configuration of the implementation for that given customer. The next, uh, the next type of operations is around uh, event and notifications. As I mentioned, some of the operations are asynchronous. So what we've built in here is a notifications for those asynchronous operations. That's what you see on this side of the screen here. On the other side of the screen, that's a first for the for, uh, film's service as well, is <coughs> a set of events uh, that can be implemented. And there's a lot of flexibility there. In terms of, uh, uh, from a vendor point of view, in terms of how far you want to push it, uh, you can generate sim simple events. You can generate no events at all if you don't want to do that, or you can generate very complex events. Uh, one of the the foundation for this uh, has been an original uh, a requirement coming from the from the business uh, from the the film's business board that 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 um, that's, that's based on information that they're interested in receiving from services, but. As we were designing those operations, uh, the vendors have also pushed it, uh, pushed the design so, uh, you know, very, very far that it is some. It is really a features that not only uh, uh, this, the feed has been useful, but that, that they truly want to implement within the implementation, as it saves them uh, a problem that they have today, is in terms of communicating with external systems and in terms of how to provide information from external system from their own product. So that's uh, uh, the, the fact that we have modeled those events in such a way that it represents um, a standard about how it can be done. It really helps them in implementing those features within their product. Okay. So we talked a lot about what was included in the film repository interface. And now at the end of the day, what can you do from it? Okay. From a vendor point of view, well, if you have to expose your product as an API, we're probably providing one of the best of breed API here. Remember that, that the design of the FIMS repository interface you know, has been done by putting a very, very large group of uh, specialists together for the, to design this operation. So you know, as, a, as a vendor, for me to spend a lot of R&D trying to design my own API, you know, may not make sense. If you look at this, you have something here that, that is and that will be used as an industry standard across the board uh, based on the feedback that we have already received. Uh, and there's many organizations that have, many vendors that have jumped on the bandwagon in implementing the repository interface already. So, you know, why not using something that would be, that would be uh, an industry standard at this point. Um, for, all, you know, each media product um, that you see today interacts with other products. You may have a repository, we, we may have a, a, an application, a product that really should be exposed as a film's repository interface. You may also have the need of communicating with other services, okay? Uh, and maybe other repository interface. So in a case of a post-production to archive. So, you know, you, not only you can be a consumer, but you can be you, you can be uh, exposing your service as a film repository, repository interface, but you can be also as a vendor on the consumer side of that interface. For media organization point of view, well, it is very complex to deal with all of those places where you start content. And then finally, films gives you a standard way of looking at this, and that goes all the way from post production to distribution and everything in middle. Okay, um, if you know spending the time to. Uh, maybe tweak your internal system to interact with a, a given uh, repository of content. Um, now it's something that we're all facing as media organizations. Uh, but now if you can standardize that your, uh, your 
you know, integrating the load system in the exact same way, it saves you a trem tremendous amount of time, time to market and um, cost, you know, to basically add a new repository to your system or to change, to change one of system by using another one. So uh, definitely a lot of benefits in, uh, in going there. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, to, to have the ability to really swap component and use best of breed product, uh, definitely something that uh, uh, organization look at doing twice due to the fact that the implementation cost is quite expensive. Well, if you have a way of easily do that, that makes, that makes, that makes, uh, um, that makes it a lot more flexible for you to have the, that ability. Now, where does it fit, PIMS within the media organizations? Okay, so the diagram that I'm showing you here, you know, shows you that media asset management can be exposed as a film repository service, the broadcast system, nearline storage, archive storage, post productions, maybe cloud storage as well. And now, this is not a theoretical slide. You know, that has been implemented within the broadcast organization already. And that, has, that implementation has worked very well and provided all of the flexibility that I had listed in the previous slide uh, no, for, the, for Bloomberg, um, uh, Bloomberg Media. Um, so that's about it regarding the repository interface. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the REST interface. I'm, all, I'm only going to do an overview on this as there's already been a session, there's probably a link that will be somewhere in here as well, that discuss uh, uh, the, f the, the REST interface. So only very high level, if you want to get more details about, uh, about that interface, I invite you to, uh, uh, to uh, look at the Richard Cross uh, uh, presentations uh, around the rest, uh, about the REST interface. So why REST? Well, we've been asking for it. The vendors and the organizations have been asking for it after they basically looked at uh, the, the SOAP interface that were already created. Um, in some cases, it is an easier standard to leverage. Um, in some other cases, SOAPs make the most sense. What we wanted to provide as part of FIMS is, you know what, if it's something that, um, uh, that will be used, we should provide it. So from this point on, any interface that will be produced within FIMS will have the SOAP interface and the REST interface. Okay. That project was about going back to the capture transfer transform and also doing that work for the repository interface and making those, in those SOAP interface compliant with REST. <coughs> okay. So um, in terms of uh, the operations that are available in, in SOAP, you know, the exact same operations are available in REST. In, term, in, in fact, the model that, uh, uh, that we are following is you know, there needs to be more or less a one-to-one -one correlation between what's, what has been done in SOAP to what will be available in, uh, in REST. Um, the REST interface that, uh, that we're also exposing will have a payload exposed as XML as well as JSON. Okay. Um, and same thing, the reference implementation slash sample implementations that exist on, for the repository also exist for REST interface. And I invite you to take a look at that. That's also something that was presented by Richard Cartwright. Okay. Uh, one aspect that, uh, that is an important aspect about the, the REST interface is the fact that the payload themselves for the operation are very similar. And actually, they're the same. If you look at SOAP or if you look at the REST interface, you know, we haven't redesigned the BM content type. It's the same thing. When you do a get of the BM content type, you get basically the exact same object. The way you make the call is a bit different. The way, the way you receive the information is the same. So we have basically leveraged all of the work done on the SOAP side and wrote a, basically a, a conversion tables to go from the SOAP to the REST. And we're using that in order to define some of the REST operation. If you are familiar with the FIMS SOAP interfaces, it will be very, very easy for you to pick up the REST interface. As I said, more details about the REST interface uh, uh, is available for the presentation here. So now let's talk a little bit about the FIMS 1.1 package. Okay? We talked about the repository. We talked about uh, the FIMS, uh, the, the REST interface. I didn't go into all of the details about some of the small tweaks that we make to the object model. Um, they were very small and I don't, uh, 
you, you will actually, by looking at the package, you will see exactly uh, what they are, but they're very, very minimal. Okay. So what's in the box? Okay. So when you're going to uh, receive the FIMS 1.1 package, and as I said, uh, that's being under review by EBU and uh, by AMOA and by EBU at this point, uh, that will make, we will actually make it available uh, to the public, you know, very soon when that when that review uh, process is being done, is done, and that should be in the next couple of weeks. Um, this is what you're gonna get. Okay. So you've got some API documentations, you've got some uh, WSDL and XSDs, uh, you've got uh, sample implementations. So that's a, if you're familiar with what existed with the previous re release of themes, this is this is a bit different. With We've listened to the feedback that we've received in terms of really packaging everything together. This is what we've done with FIMS 1.1, okay? We've also spent a lot of time working on the technical specifications to um, add a lot more details and to uh, also uh, provide a type of documentation that is useful for developers, really. okay? So let's go, let's go to the detail of what's, uh, what's included in the package a bunch of readme files, please read those files first. There's some important information in there. Okay. Um, service general specification. There's one document. If you don't know anything about FIMS, don't try to poke around. Look at that document first. Go to that document. It will explain some of the general concepts around FIMS, some of the communication patterns that you put in place, some of the, uh, uh, the possible state and the job and an object can be in. So. Uh, something that you have to get familiar with in order to understand what's going to be up what's going to be coming up next okay and what comes up next is the detailed interface technical specifications i'm going to open up uh, some of those files to see you exactly you know the format for the new specifications and you're going to see it's it's it's, it's a day and night from what we what we used to have in the films 1.7 1.07 package and Obviously, you've got your WSDL and XSD files here that represent, um, uh, for SOAP, the WSDL, the operations for uh, the different uh, service interface. Uh, the XSDs that represent uh, the object model behind FIMS. Uh, the XSD is shared with the REST interface as well. Okay? Obviously, you don't model REST using WSDL. Okay? So we have included within the technical um, specification document a mapping between the FIMS operation and the REST operations. <coughs> a sample implementation. So the first one that you have here is a, a REST implementation that is a, a basic um, implementation for capture, transfer, transform and repository. And it shows really the communication pattern that has been put in place uh, in order to implement uh, those services there. The second sample implementation is for the repository. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, there's also a session that went into describing exactly uh, that, uh, that, uh, that sample implementation. Um, if you're going to be using that, uh, that implementation, I encourage you to take a look at that presentation. Um, it is, uh, that, that implementation is a full implementation of the repository interface uh, in terms of the most important operations uh, going to from creating content, retrieving metadata, updating content, adding essences, uh, removing and purging uh, content and essences. Yeah. Okay. So that's actually what I wanted to show you uh, as part of the, uh, the technical specifications here. Instead of looking at the static page like that, I'm going to open up that file directly in here and we're gonna navigate uh, through the technical specification. Each of those folders contain a file called start here.html. Well, the name says it. Click on that one. Okay. What you get from there is, let me maximize this. So you get, uh, uh, basically, it's an HTML package that, that contains a bunch of files in there 
that have hyperlinks, where you can easily click to the object model. You can easily click through the different operations of the of uh, uh, the interface itself. The table that you that is in front of you right now represents the mapping for the rest operations. Okay. So if you scroll down from there, you can see some of those operations. Let me just take one, add content. So you have the ability to uh, click through the documentations. It directly brings you to uh, some of the uh, object model. Um, here we go. So you can see some of the requests. You have the ability to, uh, to click down through the object model. It makes it a lot more interactive in terms of how you look at the information. Okay? That's something that was very static in the previous versions of, uh, of films. Okay. And that's available now for the repository interface, for the transform, the capture, and the transfer. So we went back and we adjusted the documentation for the other services as well. Okay. So um, we cover basically what was in the box. In terms of the next step now, uh, I mentioned that the, the, it's currently, FIMS 1.1 is currently under review by EBU and AMWA technical groups. Um, and the release, should, the release should be available in the next um, couple of weeks. Okay? Um, if you are a member of the FIMS community, you actually have access to that package right now. Okay. Uh, the implementation guideline, so we also, we also uh, creating um, the guidelines for the repository interface. Uh, and that's also a first. The implementation guidelines document and uh, have not created for uh, any of the previous FIMS services. So we're spending a lot of time uh, trying to create something that will be very useful for whoever will be implementing the services. And we're doing it in two different ways. Number one, we're going to create a white paper that will be high level, that will have uh, links, information to a set of uh, you know, DYI webinar. That seems to be the way to go in terms of uh, really explaining um, different things in terms of especially implementing those, those services. So we have uh, selected a few individuals that are experts in the area, and they're going to be explaining to you basically what you need to do in order to implement a FIMS repository interface. Okay. okay. So what's next? Okay. Well, there's a couple of act activities um, happening. FIMS 1.1, after we, re we release it, um, there's a lot more other, there's a lot of other things that will be coming up in the next couple of months, weeks. Okay. Uh, number one, there's a QA project that is undergoing, that is making extremely good progress at this point. Uh, that started about a year ago. Uh, it is led by Atul Ravitan from Dizimetrix. Um, and we, uh, we are at the stage of the project now where uh, you know, the technical analysis is almost complete and that the interface modeling is actually has started. Um, based on that, uh, you know, we are targeting for the next couple of months where we will have a draft version of that interface ready for vendors and media organizations to start consuming. Okay. We have just started a new project that we named the Time Code Project that is led by Giorgio Dimino from RAI. And that project is also very important. It will provide the ability to uh, expand the existing um, interfaces to support partial, uh, to support operation on partial content. So the ability to uh, uh, transform or transcode um, content in such a way that you can do clip extraction, clip stitching, uh, in terms of transfer to transform, to transfer only uh, uh, a set of frames of a piece of content. In terms of um, uh, the repository, to have the ability to retrieve also a set of frames from, uh, from an essence and so forth and so on. So we're going back to those operations and we will extend it in such a way that, that they, we will bake in time code with some of those operations where it, need to be, uh, where it needs to be included and we will support those advanced or more um, specific operations that has to do with partial contents across all of the theme services and operations. Okay. Okay. More information. Okay. So 
technical information, the wiki is definitely the best place to go. The wiki will be updated with a lot of information post NAB as we're going to be gathering a lot of the data, um, including a lot of the presentation that we have made during, during NAB. We will uh, also be posting um, all of the information around FIMS 1.1, the sample implementations, uh, and everything else that goes around that. If you have questions, uh, I have listed here the, basically the, uh, the individuals that are sharing a different group. And I'll feel free to reach them if you have specific questions regarding um, those interfaces. Okay. We, have a we have distribution list available as well, a set of reflectors uh, to address the entire FIMS community. But it should be, uh, it should be uh, I mean, those are the name of the individual that you should reach if you have specific questions uh, about those interfaces now.